If you want to stay on this ride, you better have a strong heart. As my partner and I sat waiting for a call, I began to tell her the story that I'd seen on TV. But for some unknown reason, I couldn't remember the name of the hotel. At that moment, we got an emergency call. We ran the call, brought the patient to the hospital. The whole time, I'm trying to remember the name of that doggone hotel. Well, we arrive at the hospital and wheel the patient inside. As I'm giving my report to the nurse in the emergency room, I just happen to glance behind the desk and hanging on the wall is a calendar. And the full color large picture on the calendar is, you guessed it, the Hotel Del Coronado. Well, I tend to pay attention to these little things and took this as an invitation from Kate to visit her hotel. So, I reserved one of their smallest, cheapest rooms. And the next time I had a four-day weekend, I packed up my convertible, drove down the coast from San Francisco to San Diego, arrived at the hotel, went up to the desk to check in, and the clerk says, oh, I'm sorry, all of the small, cheap rooms, like the one you had reserved, are booked up. Hmm, let me see, oh, we do have this suite with a balcony overlooking the courtyard in the old section of the hotel. Will that be all right? <laughs> he said, I'll give it to you for the same price as the small, cheap, cheesy room you had reserved. Naturally, I say, okay, and I'm beginning to think this is going to be a very interesting stay. So, up I go, took a bubble bath, drank a beer out of the room bar. Shouldn't do that, by the way, they're terribly expensive. Jumped on the bed, as is my habit any time I stay in an expensive hotel. I took a nap and got dressed for dinner. Went down to the bar for a cocktail. The bartender brought all of my drinks. Had dinner in one of the restaurants, and when I asked for my check, the waiter told me that a gentleman who had been seated across the room had paid the check. The rest of the visit was uneventful, no apparitions, no funky stuff, until the stay at the hotel never showed up on my credit card bill. Now, I'm an relatively honest person, and under normal circumstances, I probably would have called the Hotel del Coronado, told them about their oversight. However, when viewed with everything else that occurred, the calendar, the upgrade, the free drinks, the free dinner, it was rather apparent to me that I had indeed been a guest, Kate's guest, at the Hotel del Coronado. She is a fine hostess, and I hope to return one of these days. And I have, of course, many more like this. And uh, if any of you have a particularly good ghost story, we're going to do uh, we're going to do two things. One, we are going to tell ghost stories. Uh, from those of you who call on the call-in lines. And we are going to also invite you, uh, rather than sending in a fax with your ghost story, if you have a particularly good one, send me a fax with your phone number, and I will call you open. So wherever you are in the world, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, if you have a ghost story, and I do have one sent to me here by uh, from Belgium. I've got another one from South Africa. All lines, all night, all ghost stories. Here we go. First time caller line, you're on the air. Good morning. Good morning. This is Carrie calling from Eugene, Oregon. Hello, Kay. How are you? You're going to have to get good and close to the phone because you're not too loud. How's this? That's better. All right. Well, my boyfriend's brother... He moved into this house in Providence, Rhode Island, and come to find out, it's, it used to be a funeral home, and, like, they have the places, like, in the basement where, you know, they burn the bodies and did all that crazy stuff. Cremation. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, now he feels like there's a ghost there. Um, like, things will be missing, like things you don't misplace, like toothpaste, cutting board, just gone. Gone. And, um... One time, his roommate, you know, they were just sitting there drinking coffee. His roommate went to his room because he finished his cup, and he came back out, and it was completely filled 
hot. Jason didn't get it for him or anything. And it wasn't even made right how he likes it. And he says sometimes, you know, like a door will slam. Um, one time he, like, he actually had to leave because he was so scared because there was like rubbing all on the walls and clanging noises. You know, let me tell you a little story back now. Okay. I saw a movie the, the other night. I can't recall the name of it, unfortunately. Now a million people will send it to me. But uh, it was about a man who went to work in a morgue. Uh-huh. And he was a guard in the morgue. And he would have his little guard desk, and he'd have his little... You know, guards have keys, and they have to make the rounds and turn the key so that the owner knows they really made their assigned rounds at night. And... He had a desk and a workstation uh, when he wasn't having to make his rounds. And there was this red light behind him. And in the morgue, they would have the bodies all lined up on these cots covered with sheets in a cold, what's called a cold room. But above each body, there was a pull cord. You know, some, a cord you could pull. Just in case. Just in case and uh, should uh, should somebody pull that cord it would obviously mean to the guy sitting at the desk that one of the bodies in the morgue had reanimated not unheard of and i'm, I'm not going to tell you any more than that but i will tell you it went off wow <laughs> okay yeah it's pretty weird and well, I don't, is there like who would you go about calling? Say if you wanted to have like a specialist come in there and see, you know, what was going on. Any ideas? Oh, yes. I have many people. In fact, the guest I'm going to have on this coming Monday night uh, uh, might be exactly uh, the person you're looking for. Yeah, it's pretty crazy because, you know, his they have... Is, his name now, listen to me, is Jerome Clark, and he wrote a book called Unexplained Strange Sightings, Incredible Occurrences, and Puzzling Physical Phenomena. Now... He'll be here Monday night, uh, Tuesday morning next week. Okay. Somebody like that is the kind of person you need. Okay? Definitely. Thanks so much for your help. You bet. Take care and uh, good luck. Wild Card Line, you're on the air. Yes, Art, this is Greg from El Cajon, California. Hi, Greg. How are you, Art? Just fine. I have a good one for you. Okay. Do I have about four or five minutes? You do. Excellent. Um, my wife's mother... I uh, had died back in uh, February, actually on February 13th of this year. And prior to her death, uh, my wife and children and I had stayed with her overnight in, in that house on many occasions. Sure. It was just a normal home, nothing strange, uh, very comfortable there, no problems whatsoever. You would just be visiting her and stay, stay the night? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, taking up the house uh, at the time of her death, uh, went into probate. And, of course, uh, my wife and her siblings not wanting to uh, leave the house empty, of course, because of vandals and that sort of thing. Uh, my wife and our two daughters and our unborn son uh, moved into that empty house on March 1st of this year. Makes sense. Um, shortly after, my family and I took occupancy of the home. Uh, certain events uh, started to take place. Like what? Well, um, just to paraphrase you also, at this time, on around March 10th, we adopted a, a German Shepherd Beagle mix um, that uh, uh, it made my wife feel a lot better, of course, uh, because I work late at night, sometimes till 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Mm, like me. Yeah, yeah, there you go. And uh, it gave her a peace of mind uh, because the uh, house was out in the country. Okay. Like for me. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, Within the first two weeks uh, that we took up residence in uh, my wife's uh, deceased mother's home, uh, my wife would uh, relate to me from time to time that she felt as she was being watched intensely. I myself, uh, at the time, being a complete skeptic, uh, dismissed the information as an overactive imagination, which I probably should not have. Uh, that was... Uh, uh, my belief until the evening of March 16th, uh, 1998, when my eyes were widely opened. Um, on that evening, uh, I was having dinner with my wife and children, and my sister-in-law and her two children, uh, teenage children, were um, over to the house for dinner, uh, just you know, a few weeks after moving into the house. Uh, everyone had left, uh, but my wife and I, 
and I was sitting in a position in the dining room at the dining room table area that allowed me to look all the way down the hallway into uh, one of three bedrooms, which was my uh, youngest daughter's at the time. Sure. <clears throat> at that point, I saw something that is so hard for me to describe. It was an aura of what seemed to be a woman's form with a lot to me of what seemed to be energy. In other form. words, indistinct, kind of a, a foggy light aura. Yes, sir. Uh, all right. And it, are, it definitely was, it, it was, it seemed to be the shape of a woman to me. Mm -hmm. I was so motionless and locked into what was happening at the time that I almost lost relative consciousness of what or where I was except for what was going on in that room. My wife was sitting over to the right of me and asked me what I had seen, and I described it to her, and she said something to the effect of, you too? Which, you, you too? Yeah. You mean she saw it as well? She had seen and felt things before me, and yet had never, over that period of time, that two-week period since we'd moved in there. Can you, uh, can you hang on through the break? Absolutely, Art. Stay right where you are. Yeah, she had seen it, but it was uh, at a different time. And so then what? I mean, did you sit there and compare notes with her or what? Well, I had the hair was standing up on the back of my neck, Art. I'm sure it was. And I, uh, I didn't know what to think. I just moved my, my wife and my children into uh, a house. And uh, I didn't know how long I was going to be there. Did you think about getting out? You know, I, at that point, I really didn't know. You, you know what? Um, I, I actually... It's so easy to say, man, I'd be out of there like a shot. But the fact of the matter is, there are financial considerations, there are physical considerations. You have a wife, you have children, you have a lot of furniture, you've moved into a house. So you don't just immediately make a decision to split. Let me tell you, Art, the, the rest of my notes that I have here for you that I compiled today, you're going to think more and more why we didn't uh, actually get out. On, uh, on or around March 22nd, I was alone in the house, and my wife had left with her sister and uh, my children. They went over visiting for the day. It was around the noon hour. I was uh, preparing to leave for work. I'd just come out of the restroom that adjoined our master bedroom. Bear in mind, our bedroom used to be my deceased mother-in-law's bedroom. Oh. In a fairly quick instance, as I looked over my right shoulder, and I, I can see this as plainly as the day that, in my mind, as the day that I did see it, in just a few seconds' time, I saw my deceased mother-in-law leaning over the dresser area where her dresser used to be in her room. And it, it appeared as if she was leaning over to place something down. This time, she was of more form? Yes. Uh -huh. Shortly thereafter, that situation, our uh, interesting yet strange phenomena began to occur. Uh, my deceased mother-in-law had, there was a beautiful type plush white carpet, very white carpet in her home. It was throughout the home. Um, there was no variance throughout any of the rooms whatsoever. And I, I'm just giving the detail so the listeners understand what I'm, I'm about to say. One morning, I would believe it was the end of March, 1st of April, my wife said, honey, come look at this. And I said, well, when you walk barefoot on the carpet art, it, it would leave a, almost a type of imprint of your foot. I understand exactly what you're saying, yes. And so we experimented a little bit. This was not my wife's footprint art. It wasn't my footprint. And it was much too large to either be either of my daughters. Sure. So we just stood there looking down, and my wife said, I know it's my mother's. I know it's my mother's footprint that she lived with her mother until she married me, and until she was, you know, 19 years of age. Mm -hmm. um, she felt that, you know, also too, from that time on, that the constant set of eyes or being watched was all the more ever present. Our dog, on many occasions, Art, would stand up and stare across the house into our bedroom, whining, staring. No, I, I, I'm going to ask, it's an embarrassing question, you don't have to ask, answer this, but um, if, if it was your wife's mother yes, sir. haunting the house, being present in the house, 
Uh, didn't that kind of um, take the edge off moments of intimacy for your wife? Well, at that time, Art, uh, and like I, that, that is a, a personal question. My wife uh, was only about three months from delivering our son. I see. You, 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 you say no more. That's she right. Was very pregnant. Otherwise, uh, I can imagine there would be some problems. I, I can understand what you're saying, and I, I do, I do uh, agree to that with that. To Mom, Mom if, you, if you're listening, you know what I mean. Okay. In the summer months, another factor started to come into play. Art, and this is one uh, when, I, when I was writing it earlier this evening. Uh, I guess I'm listing this in as much of a chronological order as I can. Sure. I, I was reluctant to discuss this. And the only reason I am discussing it right now is after we'd moved out and we're living where we're living now, I asked my wife if she, and I, I didn't want her to think I was nuts. So I asked her and she looked at me and said, yes, I had to. And uh, that's uh, the next part of the story. Um, at night in my wife and I's bedroom, which of course was my deceased mother-in-law's, at times, my vision in, in the dark, I would, I would lay awake at times, and it would start to blur. Very, <sighs> if not demonic type faces would appear in the dark room. They would come, it, 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 was, it was very sharp to me, and they would fade out slowly. That would be enough for me. And the thing that bothered me about this art was if this was my mother, it wasn't that obviously to me was not my mother-in-law. Obviously. Her appearance was not as foreboding as this particular situation. And I, I started, that's when I started thinking, my God, is, is, is there a portal or something no, else that that's followed? That's exactly where I was about to go. Um, we've got to wrap this up, but... That's exactly where I was going. Is, is there a clothesline to this, or is that essentially, a, did you get out of there, or what? Well, at that point, those things were starting to uh, happen at the uh, end of uh, the summer. There were thumping noises on the wall, many occasions uh, at the noon hour, almost on, on certain days. Uh, uh, frequently, the phone would ring. There would never be anybody there. And the one thing that I would like to say, Art, and this is probably of some interest to you, um, I often wonder at this point if the intrusion taking the nothing but a appearance by my mother-in-law in, in the last few recent days to my wife has appeared. There hasn't been anything since we moved to our new home. Well, um, all right. Listen, thank you so very much. There are two things here. One, it's pretty well known, and I can't explain why. Maybe you can. Maybe one of you can. Why a spirit, apparently trapped on Earth, or one that has not yet moved on, remains essentially in the same place, the same house, the same geography, the same place? Why? Why? And the second thing that I would draw from that is, he said it himself. Do you think it might be true that once uh, something has come through, or is visible on both sides, depending on how you want to look at it. That, in essence, a portal has opened, allowing not just the spirit of his mother-in-law, but more to come through. That's worth uh, some thought. On our international line, you are on the air. Good morning to you. Hi, Art. This is Matt from Auckland, New Zealand. Auckland, New Zealand. Yes, sir. Welcome to the program. Yes, yeah, so I have a bit of an unusual ghost story to tell. All right. Um, I frequently have out-of-body experiences, and uh, one time I uh, managed to catch a glimpse of my own ghost. What? What? Yes. Uh... <laughs> now, if anything would stop me from having OBEs, assuming I could have them at will, that would do it. You saw your own ghost. Yes, well, people who... Uh, frequently have out-of-body experiences will know that you can sometimes get stuck in your uh, corporeal body or physical body. This frequently happens to me and this one time um, a part of me separated while my vision remained in my body, my physical body, 
and um, I saw this watery... Oh, my. In other words, you saw you saw your spiritual self in a visual way with the vision from your own body leaving your body yeah i saw it walking across the room well i, I saw myself walking across the room with sort of a, like a third, third person perspective <laughs> um did that stop you from doing that um no that, that i've had um more hair-raising experiences than that that was that was an unusual though that hasn't stopped me. <laughs> it would have stopped me cold. All right, my friend, thank you. That's uh, from New Zealand. That would have stopped me cold. Uh, to, uh, to have the physical vision remain in a somewhat active mind and to see your spirit leave your own body and to realize that your essentially dead, spiritless body is observing its own spirit leaving. Thank you. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, where are you? I'm in Austin. Austin, Texas. All yeah. right. Um, and so it's kind of secondhand because it's something my mother told me happened before I was born. It's all right. What is your name? Sarah. Sarah. Okay, Sarah. Okay. Um, she was living in, in Salem, Massachusetts with my father. They'd gotten married recently. Right. And in the house they were living, I think it was probably an old house these things started happening. First, the cats started acting weird. Like, they'd be running across the room and all of a sudden they'd stop like there was a wall in front of them. Yes, I've seen cats do that many times. They see things we don't. Yeah. And once or twice, she said she found them in shut dresser drawers. Uh, cats? Yes. <laughs> they'd have gotten inside the drawer and it was shut behind them. Yeah. She was alone in the apartment. And once this, uh, the bathroom door was stuck, and she wasn't sure why it was stuck. She kept trying to get it open. My father wasn't home, so she had to get um, a neighbor to help her open it. And it took him a lot of work to get it open. And when they got it open, it was like 20 degrees colder in the bathroom than it had been anywhere else in the house. Really? Yes. And then my father would start, he would, feel, he, he would say he felt a hand on the back of his neck. But my mother was across the room or in a different room, and there was no one else in the house. And then the last thing that happened, my mom said this was the last thing that happened, and after that, nothing ever happened. My father came in the room where she was, and he was like all white and shaking, and told her that he had been walking up the stairs, and he saw this woman walking down the stairs towards him, and that she was wearing like old-fashioned clothes. That was all they told me. I didn't get any more detail than that. Yes. She, she was walking towards him. And then when he got when when they passed each other on the stairs, he felt like totally cold all the way through, and then she vanished. And then they never saw anything else again. I sure do appreciate the story. And I thought she'd want to hear it. Now you're right. Thank you. I wonder what it is about the presence of an entity that causes temperatures to drop. And by the way, I might add, measurably drop. I have interviewed any number of ghost researchers, and it's about half and half. Some say. They're unable to measure the temperature to drop, but they can certainly feel it. The other half say they have measured up to, as this young lady said, up to 20 degrees and more of difference. Sometimes right down to freezing. She mentioned cats and brings to mind the following. Again, from Canada. Canada must be a very haunted place. Our, where I live, we have woods by our house about seven-tenths of a kilometer by six-tenths of a kilometer in size. And in this woods is a man some time ago who hung himself, actually 70 years ago, when his wife had died at an early age. Seventy years ago, the land that everyone is now living on was farmland. And ever since those woods have been left alone, the only thing about the man was he was a cat lover. He had about four cats. And I can tell you there is something about those woods that is pretty freaky now. Every now and then, even now, there is a gathering of cats in the woods. No lie, I've seen them. They just sit around, 10 to 20 of them. 
tell you what I'll do. I'll try and get a picture of it next time it happens and send it to you. I believe the cats are gathering in this man's name. <laughs> West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Aloha, Art. This is Mike calling from Kihei, Maui, Hawaii. Hello, Mike. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. Actually, I, I told you this briefly a few years ago. Um, my wife and I, my wife Bonnie and I, had gone over to Kauai pre-Iniki, the year before Iniki hit. Oh, the big, the big terrible hurricane, yes. That's a nasty one. We stayed at a, an older, fairly flat resort called the Coco Palms. It was nice. We had driven around the day, we went back to the hotel, pretty tired, and we went to bed after listening to the little band downstairs. Sometime in the night, I woke up, I was on my back, on, in the bed, and something fairly large, kind of glowing, was at the foot of the bed. Bad. It was human shaped, and it scared the Jesus out of me, to the point where I was petrified and could not move. Describe it more than that. Human shaped, yeah, sort of a, a mist, you mean, or a, a. Try and do a little bit better. Well, at least seven feet tall. If it was a person, it probably would have weighed several hundred pounds. Oh, so this is very large. Yeah, like 250, 300 pounds. All right. Uh, the perception I got was that it was kind of glowing like a glow stick. You know those green glow sticks you crack at night? Yes. Okay, well, it scared me so bad, all I did was close my eyes. Whatever it is, it's going to go away. I'm closing my eyes. That's it. Mm -hmm. Woke up in the morning. My wife and I finished our time on Hawaii. Went to Oahu. And driving from the airport over the poly to the, to the other side, I told her on the poly and said, You know what, babe? Last night, there was something in our room. And she turned to me. And the chicken skin started. That's when we get the, the goosebumps. So they call it Hawaii chicken skin. She freaked out, out with her big Hawaiian eyes and looked at me and said, I saw it too. Hmm. And I said, well, what would you see? Apparently she must have seen a little more than I did and or perceived more than I did. Maybe she didn't close her eyes. <laughs> I sure did. <laughs> My wife says that she saw a very large Hawaiian float in through the window and stand at the foot of our bed. And it was, to her, she says, it was very pissed off. It was... A pissed off Hawaiian. A pissed off Hawaiian. Now, I'm white. My wife's almost pure Hawaiian. I'm wondering, is this a Hawaiian ghost looking down, seeing a local woman with a white man? I hear you. Angry. I hear you. That was very perturbing, and we both had chicken skin for quite some time that evening. One more recently, unfortunately, my wife's lovely father uh, lives over in Waimea on the Big Island. Yes. Uh, was diagnosed with a terminal cancer around May this year and he decided that he would prefer not to fight it and would go with hospice care and prefer to live out his remaining time in the living room at home and with a lot of the uh, homes here in Hawaii we have day beds in the living room no I, I understand that I, I think I would make the same choice so Shem that's his name you know, her dad, uh, spent out his remaining time in the living room on the, on the ho beautiful hospice bed provided. Mom lovingly cared for him. And it was wonderful because he had time and all of us family could come by and say aloha. Well, we're staying there and he has not yet passed away. And the only room left because of all of the ohana or family over is mom and dad's room, which they really don't sleep in too much anyway because they sleep in the living room. Anyway, Dad is still alive, but getting near the end. This was in, within three days of him passing on. My wife and I go to bed about 11 o'clock at night in the parents' bed. I 
sleeping on my stomach and something gives me a finger jab poke through the mattress into my ribs. It felt like it came up about two inches. Yes. It woke me up, scared the hell out of me, and I said, Bonnie! She goes, what? It was something poked me in the ribs. And I rolled over onto my back and she goes, are you okay? I go, yeah, but what was that? She goes, I don't know. And then something, the pressure of someone sitting down on my legs. And I said, on your legs? On my legs. I said, and I'm getting chicken skin now. I'm freaking out remembering. I said, babe, it's sitting on my legs. What am I going to do? She says, it's okay. It's all right. It's probably just dad, his spirit coming into the room saying, you're in our bed. I said, well, he's not dead yet. She says, I know that this is his house and he can move around when he wants. Sure. I said, babe, can I please sleep in another room? I can't handle this. It's too much. She said, okay. So we switched with her sister. And dad passed on shortly after that. We have not yet, my, myself, she's returned to visit mom twice. I'm a little leery about visiting. Why do you think the state of Hawaii is such a haunted state? I don't know. It is, though. I, I've had guests on who have told story after story, like the ones you're... Uh, you do, like the ones you just told, Hawaii is a very, very haunted set of islands. There's no question about it. You and your wife, well, your wife's from Oahu, right? Uh, that's correct. Thank you for listening, Art. I hope your audience <clears throat> keeps in mind that the loved ones are close by. Um, here is a gentleman who works, or did work, actually. He did the same thing I did in a 911 dispatch center. I guess fire dispatch center. Where are you, sir? I'm in Birch Bay, Washington. Welcome to the program. Well, thank you, Art. Um, you're you're about to tell me that you have had ghosts call nine one one. In a way, yeah. It was basically to um, oh gee, it would would be well, well over a hundred year old emergency, I would say, of a dying woman in a small Mexican village on the banks of the Santa Ana River. My God, a hundred year old emergency. Mm -hmm. Middle eighteen hundred, eighteen sixty four. To be exact. So it's a, it's a time travel story as well as a ghost story. I guess it is, huh? Well, it may be that where the spirits are, there is no time as we under quite you know exactly understand it or think we do. Oh sure, and you know if they have a story to tell, it can wait for eternity if it has to. Well, apparently uh, one did at least part way. Well, let me tell you a little bit about how this started. Uh, I had just started at this uh, fire communication center. It was on the banks of the Santa Ana River. This was in 1984. Okay. And uh, basically it was a 24-hour operation. We were on a 24-hour shift, so we would sleep and eat and pretty much live there for an entire day and then be relieved by the relief crew and uh, work that type of schedule. Uh, so normally my shift would end at 8 p.m. From 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. I would get to sleep from 8 p.m. till 1 a.m. and then go back on the board till 4 in the morning. Gotcha. And we just, that way we could at least get a couple hours of uninterrupted sleep. Mm -hmm. Well, I thought the strangest thing was that none of the dispatchers would sleep in the dormitory, which struck me as really odd. They, they all seemed afraid of the place. Hmm. And you know the dispatch personality. They're usually guys that are rock solid individuals. Oh yes. Are not. They're pretty fearless people, basically. But uh, we have guys sleeping in the hallways or bedding down in the lounge. You know that type of thing. Well, I'd been on for about a week, and I got woken up uh, in the morning uh, by the intercom saying that you know I could sleep till noon because I was going to have to work a 12-hour overtime shift. Mm. Someone had called in slip or called in sick, and I was uh, basically up for it. Well, about a half hour later, and you know, usually these things happen when you're dead asleep. I felt something lay across my legs, and there was a groan like somebody going, Ugh, you know, when they're stretching. Yes. And I woke up and I saw this kind of a, um, it wasn't a mist, it was almost like a gelatinous fog breaking above my head, and the room was pitch black dark, which was really a strange thing. So anyway, I stumbled out in the dispatch center and asked the people if, you know, what the heck was going on and, you know, why are they playing games? And they all gave a conspiratorial look to each other and said, nah, go back to bed, we'll tell you about the ghost later, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, so I said, real good well, after that. Yeah, right. Well, anyway, it was uneventful. I came back for the next shift and that's when the weirdness happened. Uh, one in the morning, 
just a little bit before one in the morning, I, I went into the strangest dream I've ever had. I was walking along the banks of the Santa Ana River, and it felt, I mean, I knew it was 1864, I just knew it. And I thought, this is the strangest dream. Uh, for one thing, <laughs> I'm here, I'm, uh, you know, I can feel the wind on my skin. It was just barely blowing, I could hear the leaves rustling. I could feel the sand crunch underneath my feet along the banks of this river. Right. And I thought, wow, this is re this is really interesting. It's, I know where I'm at. I'm right by the fire dispatch center, but the city's gone. I mean, there's nothing here. And you know, where are all the children? And you animals? mean you were literally seeing the same geography minus the buildings and the people? Except for you know differences, the variations of of a river as it changes over the year. But my oh, internal God. radar and compass told me I was exactly at the fire dispatch center. I was actually walking up to it, approaching uh, northbound along the banks of the Santa Ana River. Oh. And I saw this small house. Yes. Kind of like an adobe little house, like you would see part of a ranch here or a very small village. And this woman appeared in the door. And she was she was what you would call, oh, gee, probably a, about a 20-year-old, uh, really beautiful senorita. I mean, she was just gorgeous with long flowing hair and a smile that would melt your heart. I mean, this was like, wow, you know, what's going on? Anyway, she beckoned to me to come to the door. And as soon as my foot hit the threshold of this little house, I was kind of transported into her, if you know what I mean. It's like she melted with me, for want of a better word. Mm, Spock. We were like one person. Spock would say mind meld, yes. Almost like that, but not quite as like, you know, as trite as you would expect something on Star Trek. This was like a total two bodies and two souls instantly mingling together. Wow. And it was an instant feeling of like warmth and love and a, a tremendous sexual rush, which uh, later on I found out that that's, that happens sometimes. Anyway, she kind of separated from me and beckoned me into the house and I went in there and she showed me this old woman laying on a bed. Mm -hmm. And prior to entering the fire service, I'd been an ambulance driver in LA and you pretty much know when a person's ready to breathe their last. And this woman was definitely she was what they call chain stoking that, uh, you know, final type of breathing. Mm -hmm. And she had on a um, kind of like a floral print uh, shift dress. Yes. And this girl started to tell me that, you know, she was the last of the small village and she had stayed there and taken care of all the people that were sick and they had a, um, oh, a drought and a famine and some type of terrible disease had come through the community and killed a lot of people. And basically everybody just packed up and went up river to try to find a better place to live, took all the children and healthy people and animals, and they all just split. Makes sense, yeah. And she was the last one taking care of the last person alive that could not make the trip. Well, to make a long story shorter, she basically uh, started telling me how all these people died. And this is when the dream got really bad. <laughs> I mean, it was like I was trapped in this place. If you know, well, you obviously know the, the personality of a dispatcher that's fully in control of his environment. I certainly do. I mean, you are the savior of the city, otherwise you'll never make it. Anyway, it was the first time in my career that I ever felt totally trapped and scared and wanting to just get up and run from the dispatch center, even though, you know, I wasn't there, but I was. Right. All these faces started coming at me. They were all like Mexican villagers, which is what lived in that part of uh, California at the time. And as each face came at me, I died with them. And they were talking to me. And one after another after another. It must have been a hundred faces just coming. I mean, like, you know, literally face to face with me. And I felt the pain of their death. Uh, I take it you didn't sleep in there again. Oh, I did. <laughs> I was not going to let this... I was going to get to the bottom of what the heck was going on with this thing. Anyway... There was, the, you know, I used to hate it when one o'clock would roll along and the dispatcher's voice would come on the speaker and say, you know, get out of the sack, it's time to hit the board. Well, the, the dispatcher that was handling the shift came on and he pulled me out of my out of my sleep. Anyway, I stumbled into the communications center, didn't even put on my uniform. I was drenched in sweat. I had this big lump in my throat. These tears were just like pouring down my face. And he looked at me and said, what in the heck happened to you? So I told him, I think I just got visited by a ghost. And that's when he finally said, oh, these, these darn ghosts, you know, it's like they've been banging on the switchboard all night. I've had this creepy feeling like something's standing here watching me, and I can't take this anymore. I'm going to go sleep in the lounge. I'm not sleeping in that dorm anymore. So I figured, okay, well, you know, there is something here. It's not just me in his bed. Like something was crushing his chest. And he would talk in Spanish, and the other dispatchers would say, yeah, you know, when 
this guy's sleeping, he starts speaking Spanish, and that's when he's having these nightmares. Well, uh, it's obvious uh, to me, sir. Thank you very much for your call and your story. It's obvious to me what was occurring. I, too, worked in a 911 dispatch center in Mon Monterey County. And on a daily basis, even an hourly basis, you deal with life and death. Actually, I found it to be too much, and I spent a year at it and uh, bailed out. But you, you deal with life and death. I'm the kind of person that takes my work home with me. And so it was not the job for me. But a place of haunting? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, of course. A place of crisis? A place where death is documented nearly on an hourly basis? Sometimes more? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. On my first time caller line, you're on the air. Hello. Hi, Aaron. Hi there. Where are you? Paul from London, Ontario, Canada. London, Ontario. Haunted Canada. Yes, sir. Yes, and actually we are pretty haunted. Um, actually, the one I've got is from, happened when I was about eight years old. Uh, we were a bunch of us sitting around messing around, and the guys I was with decided to hold a seance. And we were sitting in my friend's basement, and... You, you decided to hold a seance? Well, yeah, you know, you're... Right that, that's like, you're really inviting it. Well, yeah, that's, that's what I like. I didn't take part. I sat off in the corner going, no, I just, this isn't for me. Uh-huh. Besides, I didn't really believe in that stuff at the time. I that, that after that, I really changed. Um, halfway through the seance, I kept hearing strange noises, and we were sitting in his basement, and they just kept going, "Shh, stop making noises." I'm like, it's not me. They're like, "Yeah, sure, just shut up. We're tr we're trying to get a hold of this ghost." And all of a sudden, I something made me look off in the corner. He had an old TV that his dad was going to throw up sitting in the corner. Well. When I looked, I noticed it started to glow. Mm -hmm. And after a few minutes, it just exploded. The, it, te the, the television exploded? Yes. The whole screen blew out. And what did it for me was the fact it was unplugged. Like it, the, the thing is, the TV was unplugged. When I looked on top of it, I saw other, other people have called in before about it, seeing the dark man. A well, dark, the dark man? Yes. I saw a dark... I, I could tell it was a man. He was sitting cross-legged on the TV, wearing a long coat. He just looked at me, smiled, nodded, stood up, and disappeared. <laughs> I'd be out of there so fast. Well, the thing is, no one else saw it but me. They kept... They, they well, were, I mean, yeah, but what about the television? You said the television... Oh, they all saw the, tar they all saw the TV exposed. His mom came downstairs yelling what happened, and we were just, uh, nothing. Like, I couldn't tell her, well, there was someone on top of the TV made it blow up. Mm-hmm. Um, and, first of all, a television under no circumstance, sitting there, sedentary, uh, not plugged in. Televisions do not explode, period. Oh, I know that. Even plugged in once. That'd be it for me. Well, the thing is, it, that, like... For me, I, I, you'd think you'd be scared, but I was just looking at it going, okay, that was odd. <laughs> and, I mean, since that day, I've seen the same dark man every so often out of the corner of my eye, or... So it, it's almost like he's watching. Maybe he's waiting for you. Well, that's what, that's what I think, because, like, ever since then, I've seen him, and if I don't see him, I'll hear... Like, I'll hear him call my name. Yes. And the thing is, it's it's loud and clear. Other people have heard it, and we can be in an empty hallway, and we'll hear my name clear. Maybe so one day when he calls your name, you will go with him. Oh, that's what I thought. It, and the thing is, though, like I said, I'm not afraid of it. It's almost like he's there protecting me for something. Maybe. Maybe you should be afraid. Well, everyone says that, but I don't know... Like I said, it's just something about him doesn't seem to be scary. He just seems to be there. He, he, he doesn't seem to be presenting any harm to me. Uh-huh. Um, I mean, you've got to consider that he's there for a reason. Oh, that, I, that I'm pretty sure of. I mean, that it was since that day I've started seeing other ghosts as well, so... I understand. All right, well, I, I appreciate your call. Um, I... A little hesitant to suggest to you that you may be 
associating with somebody who who is going to uh, take you from where you are now to where you will eventually be. Wildcard Line, you're on the air. Hello. Hello, Art. This is Alan in Barump. Here in Barump? Yes, sir. Excellent. <laughs> Almost neighbors, I guess. I, uh, before I start my story, I uh, had to chuckle when I, um, I don't remember, I guess it was a, a letter you read or a fax about someone from Canada and the cat story. Oh, yes. You might want to mention to the uh, to the listeners about uh, the fire we had here last week, and they pulled out what was it, about 104 cats that were dead out of the home. I don't know if you read that in the newspaper. Yes, I did. Yeah, it was pretty gruesome. Uh, pretty horrible, yes. Uh, Pahrump is a strange place in so many ways. Are you outside? Yes, I am. As a matter of fact, I'm on the porch. Not mine, I presume. <laughs> well, I'm not exactly sure where you live. No, I, <laughs> my wife says I talk loud, and I didn't want to wake the kids up. Oh, I see. So you're outside, and we're getting a little bit of wind tonight. It looks like we're going to get some rain, huh? It sprinkled a little bit and chased me in earlier. Actually, you know, it's um, it's kind of a spooky night out here, isn't it? Yeah, it's overcast. It has been all day, but not quite this bad. Here in the desert, when the clouds and the wind and the rain come, it's very eerie indeed. And here is my caller again. Out on his porch still? Yes, I am. Uh-huh. After a quick turkey break. <laughs> <laughs> all right, sir. Uh, from uh, here in Erie, Peru, what have you? Well, um, back in 1983, I was a young married father, and I took my wife and little baby, we moved to California to Long Beach. Um, I had a rather low-paying job, and I had an uncle that offered us an apartment in his apartment building if we managed it, so it was for free. Um, it was a little one-bedroom apartment, and we were so poor we didn't own a bed yet, so we had a fold-out couch. So we put the baby in his crib in, in the one bedroom, and we slept out on the couch until we could get in bed. Um, every night, usually about 9 or 10 o'clock, the baby would wake up just screaming, hysterical. We'd bring him out, and his we brought him out, he would calm down and, and go to sleep. And it got to the point for about a month where we wound up having him sleep with us every night. Uh, we finally got a bed, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, switched rooms. We put him out in the front room in his crib and we slept in the bedroom. Sure. Um, I guess it was about a month or so went by. One night I was sleeping and I started having this weird dream that turned really scary. Now, um, as I was growing up, there was a period where when I was a young kid, I had scary dreams all the time. And I guess out of necessity, I taught myself to wake up when a dream got too scary. Now, this happened to me. I woke up. Um, I was laying face down on my waterbed, and something had a hand in the middle of my back and had a hand on the back of my head and was shoving me down into the waterbed, into the pillow. And I couldn't breathe. So I opened my mouth to talk to call for help to my wife. Yes. And whatever it was, it bound my tongue. I couldn't talk. All that was coming out was a bunch of gibberish. So I was struggling back and forth, and whatever it was was incredibly strong and shoving me down into this waterbed. And I figured, well, if I wiggle back and forth enough, I'll wake my wife up. Well, she woke up and she says, my gosh, what's going on? And she flipped on the light. As soon as she turned on the light, um, whatever it was released me. And she, I looked up at her and she looked at me and she says, oh, my gosh, what happened? I feel this. It felt, she ex described that the room felt like it was just filled with hate. And I, oh. I explained to her what had happened and, and it was just, <laughs> you know, I didn't sleep very much that night. You know, we. Oh, thanks a lot. I've got a water bed. <laughs> and up until now, I've loved it. Well, um, I can only imagine that uh, that that was a uh, attempted murder. Well, let me finish the story, and, and, and it, it gets even creepier. I, uh, you know, we we said a couple of quick prayers, and the room still felt creepy. We didn't sleep much that night. Um, I was also working for my uncle, so the next day I told him what had happened, and he kind of scoffed at it. He says, "Oh yeah, right. I've never had anyone else complain about living in that apartment." And I said, "Well, I wonder what happened." And then he got kind of serious for a minute. He goes, well, there's something I didn't want to tell you. He said, a year before you and your wife moved in, um, we had uh, a couple that lived there, and the man was, this, was a drug dealer. And he wound up getting murdered in that room. Somebody came in and busted in and shot him with a shotgun. <laughs> and I said, and you're trying to tell me you don't believe, you know, what I'm telling you, that you think it's just a bunch of mumbo-jumbo. And he really didn't say much after that. And... Uh, that's basically my story. Up until then, of course, I never believed in ghosts. Yeah. And after that, I've been... <laughs> That's enough for me, sir. I've been converted. I I appreciate the call on the dark, rainy night. You bet. Take care. That was attempted murder. That was attempted murder. Can you imagine having that happen to you? Presence that you can't possibly fight pressing you down into the bed.
compressing your tongue so you cannot speak, your head, your back into the bed. No, thank you. Uh, good morning. You're on Ghost to Ghost AM. I'm Mark Bell. Where are you, please? Uh, I'm in Tampa, Florida. Tampa, Florida. Yeah, I'm listening to you on the net. Okay. Um, my story uh, goes back to when I joined the Navy. Uh, well, I, I joined in 1980 as a nuclear power electrician and got assigned to the USS Enterprise in 1982. Oh, the Enterprise. Right. And um, biggest nuclear power carrier in the world. She will not fit through the Panama Canal. She has to go all the way around. I believe that. I went through the Panama Canal myself on a, uh, uh, on a, on a large, uh, you know, cruise liner. And as we went through, we scraped the sides <laughs> of the ship, so it was that close. Well, um, it, it has to do with the uh, uh, ghosts that have been there for uh, quite some time. They've been there for a very long time. Um, the refit took three years before I even got to the ship. They took the superstructure off, put a new one on. And I was just getting to the boat as she came out of uh, her refit. And so uh, these guys who assigned watches uh, were telling me, uh, do you want a mid-watch and five and six switch gear? And I said, I don't know. And they said, well, you know, there's a ghost. Well, I'm not a right. Navy guy. Five and six switch gear? What's that? Um, that's where the um, uh, five and six switch gear is where the... Uh, Controls for the ship service term generators are ah. for paralleling and taking up and down generators. Okay, okay, and um, so I, I didn't really much believe him, and he gave me a, a mid watch, and I stood a mid watch on five and six switch gear, and uh, heard somebody roaming around in the in the back room because what we had in one of that one switch gear we had our, our little office where we had our morning meetings and we had our you know gear pullers and our electrical equipment in there and it sounded like someone opening closing drawers and moving around and i walk in there and there's only one way in and out one door and you can see it from the switch gear where you're at and i open the door and there's nobody in there and you know i thought well maybe somebody's messing with me but there was never anybody in that switch gear and th then i come to find out there was another ghost haunting number two and three switch gear and by the way, if there's any listeners who were on the Enterprise who were in EE30, Electrical Engineering Group 30, they can verify this. Um, and two and three switch gear, there was also a ghost. Now, from what I was told, these guys who were haunting had uh, been vaporized by opening disconnects when they were fully energized. And what that had done is it drew an arc and created a fireball and vaporized him and the switch gear around him. It just vaporized everything it touched. And so these people were instantly turned into uh, gas, you know, cinder. Right, and um, the one and two and three switch gear was uh, more prevalent. Um, one guy told me, he says, uh, yeah, you can't sleep in two and three switch gear because uh, he'll keep you awake. This, and, uh, yeah, this is very common. You know, when people die that way, it completely unexpectedly, instantly, tragically, that's when they seem to remain. And the thing was, he, he, he was, he was like a, a guardian, you know what I mean? He was making sure that the guys didn't fall asleep on watch, because he'd do something to you. Now, I, I was just, you know, I was wondering about the one, two, and three, because I hadn't ever seen it, so I decided to play a trick, and I decided to, to pretend I was nodding off, and it felt like someone grabbed the back of my head my hair and yanked my head and jerked it to wake me up <laughs> and I was like man <laughs> and that that did that that just you know sends a shiver up your spine I take it you stayed awake on future watch <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> that, it was really really something and, um, and you're telling me that anybody who was on the enterprise ee30 that time could verify this oh yes oh yes guarantee it guarantee it there's there's absolutely no doubt in fact one guy left his post screaming from two and three switch gear and said he'd never stand watch there again ever and he never told anybody what happened and and he wasn't in electrical engineering group theory he was uh, a, a conventional electrician sometimes really good at conventional electricians they'd let stand watch 
um, on those switch gears. But the, see, the thing was is there was the there was the nuclear electricians and there was the EE30. What what uh, kind of voltage and current were running through those? 450, 450. Right. Um, and I tremendous can't current the ratings of those generators. Uh, tremendous, I'm sure. Um, we had eight turbine generators in all, and there were four. Uh, react, or there were four main machinery rooms and two reactors for each. So we had a total of eight reactors, and each reactor, I believe, was one megawatt each. So we were running about eight megawatts of power when we were churning and burning. Whew. I appreciate, uh, and I'm sure you were glad to get off the Enterprise. Well, you know what? I, I, I never really had a problem with them. Uh, it didn't. It didn't really scare me. Um, was there any doubt about the fact? Now you say you tried to, you sort of pretended to be asleep. Yeah, I was trying to see if it was real. Do you think that it could have been your imagination? Oh no, oh no. When someone comes up to you and grabs your hair and jerks your head, you know it. You're right. You know it. I mean, that's that's something. And it it it, it happened to every anybody who ever fell asleep in two and three switch gear. Boom. They get waking up instantly. You could uh, never, never fall asleep on there I while you were on watch. Appreciate your call, sir. Yep. Thank you. Take care. He's right. There would be no mistaking somebody grabbing your hair and yanking your head up with there. First time caller line, you're on the air. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Mr. Bell. How are you? I'm sorry. I said, how are you? Uh, pretty good. And yourself? Fine. Where are you? I'm calling uh, from Southern Indiana. Southern Indiana. Yes, sir. Uh, well, uh, I'd like to answer your questions first. Uh, you had a couple, like, uh, why do ghosts stay in one place? And uh, uh, I think there was something right about uh, uh, why does the temperature change when there are uh, ghosts around? Well, I think the last caller was a very good example of a ghost that remained uh, exactly there. And if, you, if that one didn't do it for you, I've got one from San Antonio, Texas, that'll curl your hair. That was uh, that was uh, fairly scary, but uh, I was wanting to explain to you why ghosts stay there. Though. Now, uh, I was speaking from uh, the philosophical point of a ceremonial magician. I don't know if you know anything about, like, ceremonial magic or uh, Kabbalah or uh, ritual magic or anything like that. I know a little bit about it. Uh, are you familiar with uh, the philosophical elements like earth, air, fire, and water? I am. Well, they have spirits associated with those. They're uh, intelligences of sorts that are that are similar to animals uh, as far as their intellectual level. But uh, sometimes, uh, see, elementals can feed off of the emotional energy that people put out. That's right. And when people pass away, uh, they'll leave uh, their astral shell or astral body behind. And sometimes these elementals can can take control of these astral shells. And uh, They'll present themselves as a ghost when, in fact, uh, they're elementals, but they'll, they'll take on this form. And, uh, like, for example, a deceased father or a mother or something, and uh, when this person feels an emotional uh, attachment to this image they see, that elemental can draw energy from that individual. Uh, that's one reason why uh, ghosts stay around like that. Uh, so, in other words, they... They produce uh, the, one of the greatest emotions a human can have, mortal fear, and then feed from it. Yeah, fear, love, any, any kind of emotion, anger, uh, hate, uh, anything, elementals can uh, feed from that. Not all elementals will do that, though. That, that has to be something that's, that's learned from them, uh, kind of trained. Like I said, they have like the intelligence of animals. So, mm -hmm. But... Uh, that also has to do with the, the temperature change. The temperature change in the room, because, look, for example, like uh, a water elemental could produce a, a cool temperature in a room. Uh, but why would a spirit be bound, like the spirit on the Enterprise or the spirits, to, well, in effect, stand uh, stand guard? Now, I'm going to tell you a very quick story, very much like it. I think a lot of the audience may have heard this, or perhaps not, but it is a true story. Believe it. In San Antonio, Texas, a school bus full of children stalled on a train track. The train hit it, broadside, killed all the children, uh, or the majority of the children on the bus. A horrible tragedy in the San Antonio area. And 
ever since at that particular intersection if a car stalls uh, in fact people go and test it they actually take their car and they drive onto these train tracks and stop and put the car in neutral and the car is always pushed um, or seemingly moves by itself off the tracks and onto the road on the other side into safety now they have tested this they they have taken cars and put them on the tracks with talcum powder on the back of the car actually I, I have heard of this mr. bill this true story and when the car reaches the other side of the tracks there are children's handprints to be found in the talcum powder and this this can be done repeatedly it'll occur again and again and again and the story from the enterprise reminded me of that see uh something like that would uh, may work on the same lines uh that a, a talisman may work now a talisman i don't know if you're familiar with like uh how talisman, talismans operate but when a talisman is created it creates a, a vortex of energy that draws things to it so like if you create a talisman say uh bring money into your life or love or whatever else you bring you make the talisman for it creates a magnetic attraction to that uh now it's curious that there were several people involved in the in the accident when there were quite a few people together and an accident like this occurs there's a great amount of fear for a split instant before they're they're killed uh that goes to their minds now this is this would be imprinted on the the material that was around them at the time so that that could work very similar it could create a imprinted on the material yeah like for example uh the uh, the land around it the specific uh, area where the accident happened the railroad tracks yes uh, as a matter of fact iron is a very good uh conductor for etheric energies like that here we go uh and i think we're going down to san diego california and we're going to hear from a police officer named uh steve Steve, are you there? Yes, sir, I am. It was a dark and stormy night. Uh, yes, uh, bad weather. Um, the eerie weather is sweeping up through your state toward us uh, very quickly indeed. Steve, you um, are a member of uh, San Diego PD? Yes, I am. Twelve years. Twelve years? Yeah. How long ago did this occur? This actually happened uh, about twelve years ago. I was uh, just out of just out of the academy, and I was assigned to a field training officer, and we go through a couple phases of that. And uh, I was working in the southeast area of San Diego, which at that time was a pretty high activity area, a lot of crime. Mm. And uh, the guy I got assigned with had been on almost 30 years, and was pretty much a classic grizzled and and beaten veteran. So it's kind of like the rookie in the old war. Yeah, <laughs> basically the new blood and the uh, the crusty old guy. And uh, we were driving down uh, one of the boulevards down at about 3 in the morning. And as we approached the intersection in a, in a residential area, we saw a, a male standing on the corner. And as we passed him, he appeared to be bleeding profusely from the head and from the face. And just looked like he'd just been stabbed several times. And uh, as we passed by, we both looked at each other and said, hey, did you see that? And I said, yeah. And, and I was driving at the time. And I, I flipped the car around real quick. and drove back and we both got out of the car and, and we couldn't find him. He was he was gone. And then this was this happened over a period of probably maybe three to five seconds in the time it took me to put on the brakes and, and spin the car around and drive back and And he was gone that fast. He was gone that fast. And we got out of the car and we checked up and down the street and uh, there was no blood trails. There was absolutely nothing that ever indicated he was there. And uh, we got back in the car and we sat there quietly for a moment and we looked at each other and we asked each other again we said hey you know did you did you see this guy i mean he had to have been there right and we both confirmed that we both saw him and uh we pretty much decided not to tell anybody after that but uh yeah yeah that was pretty con uh, pretty convinced that that's what we saw we were thinking maybe it was a, a recent murder victim or something that may have may have again been restless or something and uh did you uh write a report up oh no no <laughs> no no, we just, uh, you know, we just talked about it with each other, and and uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think uh, we let it go out of the car at that time. Mm -hmm. It was just uh, from that point on, it really was uh, something that I thought about occasionally, and and convinced me that certainly there's something out there that uh, we're just uh, not aware of. Boy, do I appreciate the story, Steve. Oh, you betcha. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, sir. Good night. Take care. 
San Diego police officer. Convince me there's something out there. That's right. There is something out there. Now, something we don't understand, we may never understand, but it's it, you can be sure it's out there. As I keep saying, there are probably as many stories out there as there are all of you. And, and you don't really get them until you invite them, and you've got to invite them in a certain way. You can't invite them and ridicule them. You can only invite people to share uh, once they become aware that others have seen uh, some of the same things that they have seen. And then the outpouring is hard to stop. 